well, when I'm ready to retire, I have that bucket of money that I can I can accelerate my withdrawals and then still have money in the market at the same time. These are life lessons where I, if I, you would have told, if, I, if you would have asked me about that even 10 years ago, my, I wouldn't even have the knowledge to even think about it. But over time, these are the, these are the things that have entered my toolbox. You probably think of investing as a numerical thing, but it's not ultimately. It's a social science shaped by people, and that means you are your own worst enemy. My guest today is one of the world's leading experts on how investors shoot themselves in the foot, all the dumb mistakes they make. So if you want to know how you can make fewer dumb mistakes and improve your investing, improve your retirement planning, ultimately have a wealthier, happier life, I invite you to watch this interview with Victor Ricciardi, or Victor Riccardi now, I should say, a visiting professor of finance at Resinus College in Pennsylvania and the author of several books, including the one I'm holding in my hot little hands, Advanced Introduction to Behavioral Finance. And, oh, you got one too. And, uh, disclosure, Vic, I've bought two copies so far, uh, maybe more. This is a lot thinner than some of your other works, um, but it's it's good. It's kind of a hit parade of all, all the key points of behavioral finance. So Victor Ricciardi, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Um, uh, we've become, uh, we've been, we've been, we've done several of these, and it's always a pleasure uh, as we've gotten to know. Each, I think we've probably known each other at least over ten years now at this point. Yeah, yeah, probably, probably fifteen now. Yikes! For, I got to ask you though, advanced introduction to behavioral finance. Someone's probably pointed this out. Is advanced introduction is that kind of like skiing, like advanced beginner? Um, is that an oxymoron or not? Yeah, well, you know what it is, is that uh, the publisher has an, a really, you know, you know, you have, book, you have the books for dummies. This is like the books, <laughs> and books in all these areas. And so this Got isn't it, this isn't a dummy book, but this is a, any uh, specialized discipline. Uh, they approach a gr group of authors, uh, uh, and like even there's one in behavioral economics. There's one, in, there's dozens of them, and so it's a really nice idea because the challenge with a with a book like this is we essentially had so I, so the, my other two books are 600 pages uh, yep. with various contributors. This book is maximum of 50,000 words and about 150 pages. So uh, I I wrote the book with John. Uh, Kent Baker and John Nasser as my co-authors. So getting everything, all our knowledge in a, in 150 pages or so was even, it's even actually when you have a word count, we found it's a more challenging uh, aspect of things. And so th some things are left out, but we try to really hone in on what we think are the most important aspects, topics like social finance and um, the uh, human biology of investing, uh, specialized topics like behavioral corporate finance, and um, and the, even things like retirement planning. Just so we gave uh, a foundational piece on about five or six chapters, but then we each kind of expanded from what we consider our specialties and our passions within the book. It's a great overview. And like Abe Lincoln said, sorry, this is so long. I didn't have the time to make it shorter. Uh, this is shorter. And so, you know, someone's looking to jump into the topic without a you know, a lot of preamble and, and depth. This is a great way to do that. Uh, like, let me go to a lightning round first. These are sure. like not really tough questions, just whatever comes to mind. People can get to know you a little bit better if they haven't seen our other videos. You are on a long flight with headphones and you have your phone stuck. We're playing one song. What is that? What would I play? I would probably play some site, some song by Whitesnake. So it would be like still in the Okay. Or, you know, like still yeah, right, yeah. or uh, if I was if I was rocking, or if I was in love, it would be uh, you know, is this the love I'm looking for, or something, or you know. Yeah, I, I listened to White Snake back in the day. We all did, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm very much an '80s look, uh, child. I even used to have the the, the Bon Jovi hair. <laughs> the '80s, in my mind, they they were the cultural peak of you know the last hundred years. Uh, so many good things came out of the '80s. Of course, I am highly biased. Uh, but but that's my view. I'm sticking to it. Books yes. that has changed your life, if one has. Um, I would say um, a, a book that probably has changed um, my life um, would even just being, I, I, I would say nothing in particular, but my biases towards um, be, behavioral finance. So some of the earlier books by Hirsch Sheffrin in behavioral mm -hmm. finance, or even, even my colleague, John Nasser Singer, where 
Um, I, I've been investing in the market since I'm 12 years old. So I had an experience of, you know, highs and lows of markets, thinking I was rational, but then really being introduced to this wonderful discipline about 25 years ago really changed who I was. But it also, it didn't just change myself as, as an investor, but it, it changed my outlook, being self-aware, appreciating psychology, appreciating social sciences. So through the lens of accounting and finance and economics, my classical training, bringing into psychology really opened my eyes to all types of other disciplines that I don't think I would have ever been open. Maybe I could have read a literary book that would have changed my life from history, but the lens of, of, of because that's who I am, that psychology component, I would have never appreciated or the behavioral aspect of things through behavioral finance that wasn't representative in, within our traditional uh, discipline. Yep. My, my, my favorite four words of what you just said, thinking I was rational. I mean, there are so many times where I was, I thought I was rational uh, in investing in, in, in business and in life and relationships, whatever, family, friends. And I sure wasn't. In fact, I was way, way, way off from rational. But at the moment, at the time, if you asked me, I would have insisted I was rational. And I think part of uh, you know, getting getting older, uh, getting exposure, but you're reading about the study, reading about these fields, um, you realize, wow, we are a whole lot less rational. We're not even close to rational than we think. So it kind of imparts a sort of humility, at least in, in my mind. Uh, but let me let me ask one more question before we leave the lightning round. If you could make one pizza topping illegal, it would be uh, pineapples. Uh, I knew you were going to say that. Now, it, I got to admit, the it, only uh, pizza I eat is pineapple pizza. Okay, it's, yeah. it's a disgrace to to it's Italians a, everywhere. Not, no, it's, it's not. It's a sin. It's like eating sauce <laughs> yeah, out of it's like eating sauce out of a jar. It's like as we say, okay. forget about it. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, okay, so let's segue to the meat of the matter. Um, behavioral finance for for people who are are new to this. Well, probably nobody's new at this point, but let me segue to Dalbar Research, which does a yearly study about how much less money or or lower returns the average mutual fund investor earns than the S&P 500. And it changes by year. It's always, you know, meaningfully less and sometimes a whole lot less. And I know from both the hedge fund industry and the investment newsletter industry, I've worked in both, that the best times to market an investment strategy are often the worst times to actually invest in that strategy and vice versa. So my question is, as investors, are we not just like literally going against the grain of human psychology, of human sentiment, if we want to earn superior returns? Is that why investing is so hard? Well, I don't think people, when people say you're investing, it's really tied to a long-term strategy. So we're too influenced by the short-term news cycle by negative news, by the less um, fad in investing. So it's really t- trying to get people to think for the long term. And a lot of what we've experienced is, is just noise. And so we're, we're, if we're following things all the time, we, we sell winners uh, too early, we hold on to losers too long. And so if you're really a long-term investor, it's trying to utilize, removing the emotion. It's when to remove the emotion, is a way to have a non-emotional investment strategy, which is risk tolerance, diversification, but then using ETFs, mutual funds, maximizing uh, or putting as at least a ma- doing the matching the 401k plan, uh, trying to uh, plan with tax efficiency and so forth. And what do you, what do you ask? But also tying that to a fully uh, a, fi- a financial plan in which you have short-term goals, long-term goals, and intermediate goals. And you're not worrying about the uh, the investment return of the individual securities. You're worried about what your your indiv- your personal return on your investment should be based on what your investment goals are. And so it's a system, not a not an idiosyncratic event. It's it's a whole package deal, basically, which is hard exactly. to easy to conceptualize. Probably a lot harder to actually do. Oh yeah, no, it's very difficult to do. And then also most people don't, you know, that, I mean, you know, if you're a, a professional or I teach, I teach classes in this area. So I still have an advisor, which I touch based on things like insurance policies, but I, I you know, you really have for the, the, the regular individual who's just starting out meeting with a financial planner, uh, using financial advice. Um, it's very important um, and find the right 
person that you're comfortable with and so forth. It's, it's just a very important process, I think. It's amazing. You just mentioned the words, I have an advisor. And, and Vic, you are someone who's, you dedicated your whole life to finance, to behavioral finance in particular, to making people, uh, helping people to make better financial decisions. And you yourself have an advisor, which I think is pretty amazing and, and, and shows that, I guess, that humility I was talking about earlier, that like even the best boxers have coaches, even the best, a- best athletes have coaches. You don't try to do it all yourself. That's just, it just uh, struck me. And I know you've done some work in financial therapy, yeah. which yeah. is sort of interesting. Um, what percent of the country do you think needs a financial therapist, if, if I'd use that word, versus just an advisor? I would say um, uh, maybe gut feel, maybe less than 10%, 15%. And, and so, and, and I think it, it's a difference between um, does someone need a financial coach or a financial therapist? Uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, a planner or um, or advisor can be a coach, meaning, um, for example, let's say somebody is suffering from overconfidence, meaning they yep. trade too much on their account. Um, that could be a that that can not, not you know that that behavior can be corrected by an advisor by just talking about the idea that the person doesn't have enough financial literacy, and so put a plan of action in. And you, if you correct the behavior and that person starts training so much, that's that's an example of coaching. And so I, I think a lot of people just need uh, an engagement in coaching. The financial therapy piece would be the idea that people have more um, psychological problems from, say, char- they're called um, uh, money flashpoints, where pe- people have positive or good memories in their childhood. That then in their adulthood becomes very severe money um beliefs or, or disorders. And those disorders would be example like of gambling, um, you know, high gambling disorders, um, things like hoarding. And so that that's a much messy, difficult thing to correct. And because that could be a money issue in which a person, or it could be an emotional issue related to emulating their parents. And so um, there are actually financial planners who refer it's a financial therapy association, um, which I, which I, off and on I, I've had some involvement with. But essentially, I have a um, I have a graduate certificate. I took only four classes in financial therapy. So so even my comfort level as someone who is classically trained in accounting and finance and economics, I what I take from the financial therapy stuff when I train planners is the coaching aspect, and then the the planner if they feel comfortable enough. They, there are people who refer clients who they think may need a therapist to a financial therapist. But that's a, a much, you know, um, different type of process. I mean, you can even offend a client referring to somebody as a financial therapist. So, so, so that would be a, a much, um, I, I think, a much limited uh, scope of, of individual. Yeah, it's interesting idea. I mean, it, it makes total sense in theory. I mean, even if it's new to a lot of people, because it's probably not that well known, it, it does make total sense. But I can also see people think of investing as a numerical thing, you know, which it is on the surface. But underneath, you know, if you if you look at you know almost any of the behavioral finance literature, it's, it's not so numerical at all. It's highly emotional, highly prone to bias. And, and I guess you're right. Certain people have, I don't want to say deficiencies. Deficiencies that sounds kind of bad, but you know, different, it could be from their childhood or some people save too much money, eat lentils every day. Uh, they don't spend a dime. They, they're, they're, you know, hoarding money, if not hoarding things, hoarding money. And, and they maybe need to learn how to relax a little bit. And, and maybe a, a, something geared more towards therapy can help unlock some of that behavior, I, I'd argue. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and as I said, the coaching piece, and it really comes out of um, um, people after the financial crisis of 2008, started to come into their ther- therapist with money problems and the light went on also okay um uh, if you call yourself a money therapist you can actually charge more per hour if you're just a regular therapist i think huh. so, so um so, <laughs> suddenly they, and, it's but, more, yeah. it, 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 it is very valid um there's even um that those money disorders um uh a thought um uh, there's actually a, 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 a it's called the it's like a clans money script and money um uh money related behavior uh, survey where I think of in financial therapy where if you actually take that survey 
it's, it may eventually become something similar to the Myers Briggs mm -hmm. um, yeah. idea. So there's actually about seven or eight different dimensions that you measure people's money behavior, and it's a, it's a very um, interesting uh, instrument to fill out. You talk about in, in the book a little bit things like birth order. Uh, effects on risk-taking behavior, generational effects like Gen X's, like like us, we, we tend to be a little bit more risk averse. Uh, I interviewed a, a professor from Cambridge, uh, Raghavendra Rao, who uh, studied, uh, he actually won the Ig Nobel Award. He, he studied uh, prenatal pollution exposure like and CEO risk-taking behavior, not quite investing risk-taking behavior, but CEO risk-taking behavior. And he found that CEOs who were born uh, in and around uh, EPA Superfund sites, who, whose mothers, you know, lived there when they were pregnant, had a propensity to take greater risks than CEOs who were born in, in healthier regions. Uh, what do you think of the research in this? I mean, it seems like some of it could be a little bit delicate. Obviously, Ig Nobel uh, is uh, interesting. I mean, I, I think uh, Raghu was, was fairly proud of that, actually, because it makes his research unique. But do you think this is something we'll see more research into as we move forward? Yeah, well, it also relates to the idea that I think generationally, if you if you look to see how people, um, different generations, I think about the stock market. Um, you know, if you like me, I'm generation I'm generation X, so I started investing in the market in the early 1980s as a 12 year old, and I saw we eventually essentially saw a bull market that lasted outside the 87 crash about 17 years. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, so we had, so we saw these wonderful this wealth creation. You, you go a generation ahead, and if you um, experience, uh, you know, the the internet bubble bursting and the financial crisis, and then even with the uh, the pandemic, um, you know, you've had a twenty five year span of of three bubbles, and for those for that generation, if you have parents or you paid attention to the market, you don't necessarily have a good um, viewpoint of the market. And so that's yeah. educating people over really what the long term looks like, but also why things happen, but also how you could have invested um, in those times uh, and not panic. And as I said, having that, going through that not emotional strategy, you know, we're, we're, we're predisposed to be greedy. So we tend to buy high and sell low, well, we should do the op, you know, we should do the opposite. We should, when, when things are going down, we should buy on, you know, buy on fear, sell on greed. But as human beings, we are not primed to do that. So that is another thing that makes the long-term investing very difficult to hear. So true, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, speaking of the generational stuff, by the way, young Japanese people see stocks as something for old people. Because yeah. the Japanese stock market has been just, you know, it, it's flat for, for down and flat for so long, 25, 30 years, that the last time people really got into stocks was in, in the 80s before they crashed. And that was an older generation. Um, just I just wanted to, to, to detour briefly, Vic, on, on specifics and to just to get your opinion on index investing. I don't know if you've seen the Hank Bessenbinder uh, findings. I think he's out of the University of Arizona or somewhere in Arizona that, that 4% of U.S. stocks generate essentially all the returns. The remaining 96% just match treasuries. And, and similarly, in the time dimension, I read that the best 1.9% of trading days over the past 20 years, if you are, if you missed those, the best 1.9%, your returns would be 93% lower. Now, conversely, if you missed the worst 1.9%, they'd be like 2,000% higher. But anyway, the bottom line is it, it's almost like a indexing is sort of casting a very wide net. Long-term investing is also casting a very wide net because we can't just go in and pick and choose which days we want to be. We could try, but we're probably going to fail. Uh, it's much better just to sit and hold the course. Uh, do, you, do you think most people should just index? I don't know necessarily just index, but it shows that people should have a a a, 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 um, a certain amount of their wealth in the stock market and not trying mm -hmm. to chase winners or losers. Um, you, you can you can you know. Um, what I what I my concern about the indexing is indexing again, even like with growth versus value, indexing could do very well today. But what happens when something changes? I think yeah. behavior. The, one of the behavioral issues that we face with it's not accepting 
that last 10 years may not be different than the next 10 years. So the idea is, I would say, hold those indexing funds, especially if you have to within a 401k plan, but then use other strategies that you know, that gives you that cast or net, that wire net, because again, sentiment changes in the market and you don't know when things are going to change for whatever reason. We we know what we know and we don't we know what we don't know. And so the idea that one thing is going to continue for the next 50 years or 40 years, uh, that's why even in my own portfolio, I, ha I have the small cap, mid cap, large cap. I have um, in some index funds because also that's what my 401k plan gives me a choice of depending on the company I work for or the organization. So I diversify across all those avenues. Just the idea of having a certain amount of money in each bucket ensures that I will make money every year in something within my portfolio. But also you want to, I know it's hard to accept, you want to have things that have a negative correlation that aren't doing well because when things turn like inflation, I, you know, I had energy stocks for a long time and then all of a sudden they were underperforming and all of a sudden they popped the last two or three years and I've done very well. So having things in your portfolio that's truly really diversified you're going to have underperformers or dogs in the portfolio. It's just having enough diversification where you have patience and you can't have that. And then as I've gotten older, my perspective has changed a little bit more where I still have growth, but I have implemented. I'm not worried so much about what I'm going to have to maximize my portfolio. As I get closer to retirement, maybe in the next 15, 20 years, I'm starting to integrate in income within my portfolio now, rather than worry about timing the market when I am ready to tire. And then I've even uh, implemented using annuities with say a, a guaranteed floor of 3% in which I rather than, fi rather than fixed income, I view that as my bond portfolio, but then also that ensures that I have protection of downside risk, but I have a glide path to when I can retire in case the market doesn't do well when I'm isn't doing well when I'm ready to retire, I have that bucket of money that I can I can accelerate my withdrawals and then still have money in the market at the same time. So yeah, th these are life lessons where I, if I you would have told if I, if you would have asked me about that even ten years ago, my I wouldn't even have the knowledge to even think about it. But over time. These are, the, these are the things that have entered my toolbox, not just the aspect of being able to finance, but implementing things of what do I, you know, do, do I need, if I need $100,000 in retirement, is my portfolio going to have enough for income to produce that if you combine that with Social Security? You, well, you're, you're talking to the former lead advisor of Motley Fool's income yeah. investor uh, yeah. research service. So yeah. two, two thumbs up uh, yeah. on the income. Definitely something that near and dear to my heart. And yeah. income stocks, I and mean, there's a lot of evidence that they tend to do better. Not always. Not sometimes they're in the doghouse. But in general, over time, they, they tend to, to perform better on, on a risk-adjusted basis. You know, as well. I, I, people think that growth stocks are sexy. I think dividends are sexy. As Mr. Hello. Wonderful says on Shark Tank, cash flow. <laughs> totally, totally, right? I mean, sewage companies, like I said, no one's going to stop flushing their toilet in a recession, right? Yes. I mean, you know, yeah. but buy the, the unsexy, the unloved stuff, you know, the, I don't know if the, the 1994 Lakanashak Schliefer Vishni study, right? And yeah. you buy the, the low sales growth, low PE stocks, uh, outperformed the, the, the decile opposite by 11 percentage points per year, which is phenomenal. And they went on to have their own asset management company, actually. Uh, you know, partly based on study. Uh, you have done a lot of work in this book, especially about retirement planning or how behavioral biases affect retirement. How would you frame this up? I and mean, retirement is why we invest. Just about everybody invests for a better retirement. What are their sort of behavioral bugaboos that we need to be watching for? Uh, how can we watch for them? And what can we do about them if we see them? Uh, yeah, and actually, in the new book, we uh, we go in, I, we organize it by IRAs, 401k plans, uh, the Social Security decision, and the annuity puzzle. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the um, first aspect that really stands out, especially in terms of like 401k plans or IRAs, especially the, the IRAs, uh, is the idea that um, you have two groups of investors. I would say one are overconfident investors, or really more more out more overconfident traders, and then you have a status quo bias um, investors who are very com 
complacent or suffer from inattention. So especially- Not too aggressive and too passive, basically. Yeah, yes. So like, you know, an IRA account, especially that you can, you can invest in almost any investment, like any kind of stock, and you don't, you don't have the capital gains issue to deal with. I think people are more likely to be 100% in stocks with those overconfident investors, but they're also more likely to trade with their retirement accounts uh, versus- mm. The, and so that you know, and then too much trading leads typically to lower returns for most people. So if you gamble with your retirement money, it's really supposed to be long term money. So not you know you don't want to be trading your retirement money all the time. Uh, versus the other, uh, or you don't want to be overly active. Uh, versus the other people who are status quo bias or people who suffer from inertia, they finally start to invest in retirement accounts, but they don't see an advisor. They go with an asset allocation strategy that was, oh, this is what my friend is do, doing, kind of known as, known as social loafing. And then, and then they don't monitor their portfolios even once they've made their asset allocation decision. So I think really between those two investors, you want to find a middle ground where you want to um, think, use things like rebalancing, dollar cost averaging to build your wealth. But you don't want to move around your wealth where you're going to miss market. You're going to do market timing. So that's where I think, um, yeah, because that's why even if people are invested in retirement, if they don't have the right strategy, if they don't, if they're not meeting with an advisor or at least a plan sponsor of the 401k plan, they are going to come up short in retirement, even if they're saving. I mean, even if you look at the things like the idea of um, once people. Or people are offered a retirement, a four hundred one k plan. You know, some studies show a third of people don't even take advantage mm. of the match. They're leaving free money. So that's so that's yeah, the, you know, pretty amazing. And then, and then the book has a whole separate chapter, and even the retirement chapter talks a little bit about the idea of nudging. That's why you have people who are automatically enrolled into retirement accounts because once. If you're not voluntarily asked to, if you automatically yeah. put people into an, an account, well, then, I'm sure participation goes way up, right? Yes. Opt out versus opt in. The problem, though, is that those those require those regulations or policy perspective doesn't require financial literacy, and does not uh, um, require require say a meeting with a financial planner. So many ma many people in their twenties, for example will automatically be opted in, but if they have three or four positions during, or five positions before they're even 30, a percentage of them wind up withdrawing from the, they close out those accounts and pay the penalty and withdraw the money from the retirement account anyway. So it's, it's a good first step, but it has to require education to realize people don't understand the time value of money. So they're taking those $2,000 out of 401k plan, not worrying, not realizing that that potentially is tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands oh, yeah. of dollars when they retire. Yeah, it's really amazing. I, I wrote an, uh, actually a blog post to my son talking about, you know, he's, some kids at school had these $400 belts. I'm like, first of all, it's ridiculous. But second of all, uh, and he's, not, he's actually not a materialistic kid at all. He's, he's yeah. way better in a million ways than I was when I was his age. And I was, yeah. you know, greedy and wanted everything and I didn't, didn't really want it. I thought I wanted it actually. But but that four hundred dollar belt now is is many many thousands of dollars of retirement money. If you have that money compounding at you know whether eight nine ten percent a year, it's amazing the difference. And in fact, let me go back to one thing you said too, because I, just sharing from my own personal experience, uh, the there is tremendous value in bringing things onto your dashboard of psychic attention. For for 12 years, I was at Motley Fool. I used to run the research department. Like I mentioned, I ran a, a dividend stock research service. I was very, very active about the market. I mean, I was doing investing every day for my job. Yet, ironically, for my own personal portfolio, I was one of those passive people that you mentioned, the status quo bias, like doing very, very little, having way too much in cash sometimes. I mean, I wasn't colossally bad. I knew enough to not be colossally bad, but I was far too inactive and I, I just sat on my laurels and I didn't put money to work sometimes. And I'm financially sophisticated. I used to be an institutional investor. I'm sitting here telling people every day how to invest, but I'm not active enough myself because I was just so focused on doing it for other people. It's kind of like you're cleaning someone else's house, but you don't clean your own, right? So mm -hmm. you know anybody, anybody could fall victim to these biases. 
Yeah, I mean, especially in the in the the first two books, uh, which are like twelve hundred pages. Um, the the one thing I would say is the general finding I, I would see is that um, everybody suffers from biases. Is that the retail investors suffer more than the institutional, and then the institutional will at least at some point correct those biases. I think the the retail investor, uh, especially clients, are, are have much more biases and they're much more difficult uh to correct they don't know they have the biases right dunning kruger yeah. effect probably yeah i mean also the, also the finan many financial planners just are, don't have the tool toolbox to, to train people um you know, a lot of it's just basic sales strategy a lot, I, I think it's, and it's not just the biases it's like it's if you're trying to educate a client uh from a planner point of view uh, my perspective is you have to provide financial literacy, you have to explain what you're doing, you have to communicate what you're doing, and also you do have to find, explain a history of, uh, of markets as well, and then, and then take into account biases. So it's not just all about the biases, it's the, and the, the entire holistic attention that you're providing to the client and even yourself. And so it takes a, a commitment of time. It takes a commitment of intellectual curiosity among the advisor as well. Um, and also the realization that you're not going to save every client. Sometimes you have to let a client go if they're eating up too much time, or they're, they're the overconfident investor and they're not going to listen to your advice as well. So I, I think trying to find that balance is, is very uh, difficult. So you, you mentioned advisors quite a bit and they do the kind of the, 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 heavy lifting in our society currently, at least for the people who find them and connect with them. Uh, and you mentioned you yourself uh, go to one, even though you're, you're quite an expert, one of the world's leading experts in behavioral finance. Let me ask you this though. Uh, what do you think, Vic, about the future? We have a technology, we have AI, uh, you know, people are using, especially the, the young people, they're, they're all digital with their investing. Uh, are we going to have more, more nudges, more opt-in versus opt-out? Are there different financial, uh, or, or I'm trying to think tricks, I'm not really sure the best word, but are there different IT tools that can help people or that will emerge to help people combat these biases over time? Do you think that's an industry? Oh, yes, uh, definitely. I mean, even, but it's even, even with the nudges, the research shows that you have to change the communication or the nudges. So, so if you're just sending emails to somebody, eventually they're going to be become the complaint. They tune them out, yeah. They tune you out. So it's got to be emails, phone calls, um, you know, text messages. Yeah, show up at their house. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But there, ha there, there still has to, and there still has to be a human element to all of this. I think technology is a wonderful thing. Um, the, the thing is, um, even what I'm teaching, uh, you know, I understand the importance of a financial calculator or, or Excel, but the... As human beings, we still need to understand the inputs and and the outputs outputs that are produced by the technology. Um, I know we have all this um, AI craze going on and, and things like that. So I believe that still technology will be a sub supplement to learning. But at the end of the day, people are at least a percentage of people are still going to want uh, human interaction. Um, and because there's always going to be questions, there's always going to be people who are visual learners. So that there. So, Versus there are going to be people who just want to do everything by technology, which is fine, but there's still going to be a human element, especially, you know, the joke that, that I used to tell is, okay, you're going to have this AI. So what's going to happen is if the AI starts acting like human beings, then they're going to need a financial therapist <laughs> and financial <laughs> coaching. <laughs> Right. I mean, so no, I, I don't worry too much about being unemployed. I'll just be talking to a robot, you know, on a Schwarzenegger <laughs> from Terminator. So, you exactly. know, so, um, yeah, Who eats I think, pineapple on his pizza. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think it's all a wonderful field uh, to think about. And, and even like one of the reasons I use an, an advisor is because if you want, if you want to buy a life insurance policy, if you, if you want to do certain types of annuities, you have to go through an advisor anyway. But, but even myself, um, you know, I, I don't have the most difficult taxes in the world, but even if you have 1099 income, if you want to make sure Social Security, uh, that you're making, making sure you're paying the right uh, balance of uh, wages, that requires a good CPA. I would rather 
sleep well at night knowing I'm doing things correctly. I'm not worried about an audit. I'm just more, I want, I want to know my taxes are doing. And, and it's really either, it's like insurance. You either pay late, either pay, pay now or pay later. And so that's where I think it comes out. I did my own taxes by hand for many years and thinking I was smart. In fact, it was the dumbest thing ever. Once I got a, a real tax advisor, I realized, and she's like, oh my God, James, you know, <laughs> uh, it's a pity we can only go back three years, right? Because yeah. you know, you've been paying colossally too much. Uh, I just didn't know. I didn't know, right? I want to be an honest guy, you know, I try to do it right. Um, I just didn't know. Uh, and there are probably a lot of other things like that. You know, people, I guess that's my, one of my questions is, aren't the people, so, so you're one of the people on this earth who, in my mind, probably least needs a financial advisor and you still have one don't the people who really desperately need them don't they have the problem of not realizing that they need the advisor somehow they don't make all those connections in their mind isn't there some way is there some way i guess we could ever match up the people who truly need that help with the helpers well i mean i i think it you know it, it would be more of like uh, you know and this is where you can't have to worry about conflict of interest but even like any more engagement of people when they open a 401k plan uh, getting those, but you know, and that's the biggest uh, I think deficiency in the four hundred one k plan. Uh, I think it's a wonderful instrument, but to me, I know that people complain about the menu choices. I I think many times is the biggest um, problem with that legislation from the nineteen eighties was the idea that people would be expected to make their own asset allocation decisions. Mm -hmm. That there wasn't more of a better fiduciary responsibility given or being allowed by a financial advisor to make those decisions. So that's um, something that maybe will be revisited with all these uh, new retirement acts coming through um, at some point. Um, but I think it's also just a matter of trust and control. As financial experts, we think we know more, so we're much more controlling. And so having that humility has come over through a lifetime experience. So letting someone do my taxes is realizing if I let them do it, I, you know, it's a lot more stressful on my back. It's one less thing for me to do. I have uh, my time is valuable to do other things. So it's like anything else we say in economics: opportunity cost. So opportunity cost can work to your advantage if you're willing to let people do. I mean, a doctor who's a surgeon can't operate on themselves. So actually, and and also verifying. Also, for me, a lot of it is verification. If I'm if I'm meeting with an advisor, just to see what's going on. But also, the, the tax laws change all the time. So so having Having that insurance and that backup, I think, is, is very important as well. Yeah, just to, in general, it's an area I think people need to respect a lot more, and we're, we're finding that out. And I'm glad over the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, a lot more respect has flown, has, has moved into the field, I should say, of behavioral, flown might be too aggressive, but moved into behavioral finance. Originally, um, it, it was almost like an antagonistic relationship, or maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating it slightly, but kind of the old school mathy finance people kind of look down a little bit on behavioral finance. Things have changed quite a bit now. And now yeah. pretty much everybody ex, uh, respects it and, and sees it as at least an equal. Uh, and in fact, in many ways, uh, the, the, the mathy finance is, is the tail people thought was wagging the dog, but it, it's really, it's human emotions. Emotions are, are, are economics, I should say, is a social science driven by human emotions. That's what really changes markets. That's what changes individuals' personal financial outcomes, too. And making financial decisions is, is difficult. If my, my students struggle in my classroom. I try to explain it, it's, there's no such thing as fast food finance. Um, yet, actually committing yourself, being thorough, studying, learning. There's something called a, a tenure rule where it takes about 10 years to become an expert. Even if you're gifted like Tiger Woods at golf, he still had to practice. So even if we have that knowledge, we still have to practice. That's why we you know if we have, you have credentials, it's continuing education credentials. So I, I don't, I, and even for myself, I tend to train people to keep those credentials going. So that's my incentive and my interest for for always keeping up with, on what's new. Uh, but also, I, you know, uh, I always talk to, to one of my colleagues about this. The, the old rules still apply. You know, I've had this discussion of back to, for example, back to basics. The basic things still work. Maybe there's things that change over on the edges, but the problem in Wall Street is we're always looking for the new shiny apple. We don't necessarily need the new shiny apple. If, if we stick with, with the basics and make modifications and, you know, uh, 
you know, is, is there a difference between having $2 million and $5 million? You know, if, if you're able to get to $2 million the old way and sleep at night, I'm doing pretty good if I've, if I've impacted enough of my students and other people to, to think about that long-term investment perspective. I've done well, like Tony Robbins says, mastery is really mastery of the fundamentals. Same thing here. Yeah, I mean, we may, that's why sometimes we, things need to be complex, but we need to make them simple enough for people to understand and, and deal with. Well, Vic, you've been generous with your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, if someone besides the book uh, wants more Victor Ricciardi, where would you send them? Um, if, if there's any repository, if there's any like mother load place to um, go. Well, I'm always active on Twitter. So if somebody wants okay. to just search um, by my name or even by behavioral finance, my, my name will come up. I'm about 60, I'm up over, over 69,000 um, Twitter followers. And I, and, wow. and, I, and I don't have an agenda. My agenda is to educate people. So I'm not looking to manage money. Um, I'm very happy being a teacher. I enjoy it. I change lives and that's why I'm in it. And so if I can educate people to make better financial decisions, all I, all I do is post uh, news stories about finance and even about my own research. I, I do a little bit of self-promotion, I admit that. Uh, but it's all in the good humility of trying to educate people. You know, when you write a book, you're not making money from it. You, I, all I want to know is people are buying it and reading it, enjoying it and learning from it to make them, you know, better decisions. A hundred years from now, you and I are not going to be here. But at least if I know that my books are being read and my research has impacted generations to come, then that, aside from being in the classroom, I've done, I've had my accomplishments, you know. So, so th th to me, that's... Yep. Yeah, if there's millionaires out there because of me, I'm very happy about that. I'm sure there are. You know, we are we are moving as a society towards a better view of finance, a better view of behavioral finance, and that's thanks to to people like you. Uh, you're, you're at the vanguard uh, of that effort, uh, writing books, uh, talking to people like me. Uh, so, so, Vic, thank you for what you do. Uh, thank you for this interview, and as always, thanks to you guys for watching us at home too. And buy low, sell high. <laughs> try, I try. Yeah.